there was a frequent insistence on the need to avoid any antithesis between the art celebrating, the proper celebration, and the full engagement of the faithful. The primary way to foster the participation, I love this, of the faithful is the proper celebration of the rite itself. Isn't that great? So how do we how do we you know engage people in the participation? It's just do it right, do what it says, you know, and follow and follow the uh, instruction carried out for us on how to do it, rather than really needing to manipulate or innovate as much as we think we need to. Uh, full authentic liturgy and various legitimate expressions of liturgical piety and reverence. This both and authentic and legitimate expressions clearly demonstrates the power of a well celebrated liturgy. Okay. Okay. Kind of the mystery. As we've seen, the Eucharist is a mystery to be believed in preparation for the celebration of the liturgy of the church. We do, we do well to understand that. However, uh, belief is further explained and enhanced and sometimes challenged when the liturgy is celebrated too. Uh, think about this in, in secular life. Mystery is more likely to be avoided rather than celebrated or believed, right? Oh, I don't get that. That's scary. I don't want anything to do with that, right? Um, for me, I could think, well, the stars, aren't they pretty? But I don't really think about it, so I'm just going to look and keep my distance. However, you can study the stars, and you appreciate even more. You dig in and, and you celebrate at the beauty of God's creation, and especially here in the liturgy. When I dedicate what I do not understand, I often choose to ignore. But for the Catholic believer, believing and celebrating are normative responses to the mystery of God and God's love. So that's countercultural, you can say, it, right? Um, everything that re related to the Eucharist should be marked by beauty. And uh, there's, you know, the, the book talked about um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, the church says there is objective beauty as well. And I will not go into that. Okay. Let's take the time. Um, the Eucharist, uh, the diversity can be neither ignored nor enshrined, but must be seen as an integral part of the personality of the worshiping community. Appreciation for diversity yields unity and identification, <coughs> and principle of diversity extends beyond the ethnicity to the diversity of the ages. Now, my subject, the music of Christian art, right? Uh, let's include everything, right? The both and, the contemporary song, hymnody, and chant. Addressing the question of liturgical music and youth participation, many would equate a more contemporary, almost rock and roll style of melody and instrumentation for the taste of young children. While this, uh, Christians, I mean, while this may be true to some extent, Anyone who regularly works with youth knows the diversity of their musical tastes in the liturgy, including enthusiasm for him to lead a chant that can make up a more classical repertoire of liturgical music. This stems from youth's desire for authenticity more than contrived or given. So don't be afraid to encourage chant to have its private place, to encourage more contemporary pieces of music with hymns and songs of the tradition. At the same time, it is also important to remember that a broad range of liturgical music is permitted and even encouraged. On a personal note, in my experience, this integration of a broad range can be overwhelming, especially if your repertoire seems quite full. A careful examination of your current repertoire, however, might reveal that some of the songs considered Traditional, but not necessarily hymns, might have to be scrutinized more closely. Specifically songs written since Vatican II, so 70s and 80s, right? In other words, have become part of our Catholic folk tradition or heritage. Try to look at especially those songs from the 70s and 80s to determine if those, that, that music is indeed timeless or a timepiece. Marty Haggadas, we call it Haggadas. Uh, as much of the mix is great, but is it still as reverberant as it once was? We'll have to determine that for your congregation. While that music may still comprise much of our hymnals, I suggest that you not rely too exclusively on that genre. And I think you know that. Okay. Um, in judging the appropriateness for liturgy, one will examine liturgical, pastoral, and musical qualities. Liturgical appropriateness. Each song's text should reflect the nature of the Mass. The direction of lyrics should be toward God, less about God to us, or less about us to each other. This calls into question whether our worship is vertically oriented toward God or horizontally towards each other. We should be very cautious with lyrics that casually place the singer in the position of the voice of God. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to indict myself on this too, but think about this. I, the Lord, see <coughs> it's going to so remember who you are, right? Even though you're singing the voice of God. I am the bread of life. 
I know I, you're not, I know I'm not the bread of life, but we're singing, that's John 6, we're singing scripture. But just be careful about the context. You know what I'm saying? Um, not to say that those should be sung, but to be aware of what and about whom we are singing. We should make sure that the songs with original lyrics outside of scripture or liturgical sources are a communal prayer rather than an individual's own spirituality. Herein lies the difference between religious music and sacred music. And this is distinguishes what is suitable within liturgy or otherwise suited, uh, fitted outside of liturgy. So, here's, here's how I have written down here. A song about one's personal faith journey like, usually reflects God's presence in their lives and hence orientation of God incarnate on earth, which comprises religious music much of On the other hand, sacred music is that praise of God in heaven, right? which is exactly the purpose of the liturgy, the glory of God, and the sanctification of the faithful. Since praise of God in heaven is an experience in which we can all partake as members of the church, praise of God in heaven this way is a truly communal prayer suitable for public worship in the liturgy. Pastoral judgments, it's pretty simple. Consider the needs of a worship and community. One, will the music effectively lead the congregation to prayer? Will the music draw it into prayer, or will it distract or push away from prayer? And will the music lead to active participation? That's your question for yourself. And then musical judgment. Is the music itself suitable, I say worthy for Mass? Does it balance uh, an interesting but accessible uh, style of music, simple but dignified? Does the music possess aesthetic qualities that can bear the weight of the mysteries celebrated in the liturgy? This evaluation of these three judgments requires cooperation, collaboration among all those groups of people. The inclusion of young people and great instruments are permissible as long as they are suitable for sacred use. And it's, like I said, more than just suitable, I like to use the higher standard of whether or not it is worthy of holy mass. As the most important prayer event of our church and our faith, mass is not just a place to experiment new ideas, to see that. Rather, we must take a sober look at what deems appropriate for prayer and the faith to see the well mass rather than just seeing at mass. A variety of styles and sounds. You can read this paragraph here. They respond, um, rather than just what we sing, it's, uh, especially in this day and age, it's more of how we sing. Do we sing it like we believe it, or we mean what we're doing? So, the inclusion of well played um, liturgical music alongside more classical styles should be a welcome element for most parish communities. So, uh, the, the responsibility is almost in the leader at that point is are they prepared, are they enthusiastic, and are they perfect? You can say, all right, they want me to do this contemporary song, so here we go. You're better off not doing it, if that's your attitude. Whatever style you this or that you want to do. Alright? I'm ready to pray. We're going to pray through this song, and you're going to go for it. There are many styles of prayer that should be made available to people of all ages, especially the youth, who may be searching for more effective methods of personal prayer. The one voice in the liturgy. Sometimes music might become the precise vehicle for individuality to thrive. An individualism, individualism undermines the communal nature of prayer. So we must find our way how we can bring those two together. So we go into more specific um, musical uh, intricacies of how we can uh, bring that about. But I think most of you are, are not musicians or involved in musical history, right? So I'm, I'm going to give up. I'll give you the, the shorthand version here. Um, we must shun any in the appearance of individualism or division. Keeping <coughs> before their eyes, we have only one father in heaven, and accordingly, are all brothers and sisters. I'm going to go on. Okay. Oh, you guys hear me okay? It's just a party. It's just a party. They're bad. They're preaching to the ears of the young crowd. Don't be, uh, you know, the preachers should not be afraid of what may come across as, you know, um, uh, passive receptivity to what they have to say. Ethnic, social, economic differences, we are preaching to a very vast, uh, diverse congregation. But, um, just make the homeless less about meditation and peace, but more about the dialogue between God and His people. Since the priest is in persona Christi and the person of Christ at that moment. The preaching is about those things, but uh, more about the great needs of salvation and the demands of the covenant of the state. The covenant homilies, um, again, I don't think many of you are preaching homilies. 
the, the, the inclusion of uh, elements of popular culture that could be known to me, and it might entice them to listen more intently, like using colloquialisms or slang, or whatever. But it could just as easily distract or exclude others. So the greatest challenge for the preacher may very well be carrying out the Lord's command to all the nations. Liturgy not for you, but with you. We we'll talked about that part. Um, rather than the liturgy before you, it is more uh, rightly addressed as liturgy with and by you. Except for the ministry of the ordained, the two different ministries, properly understood and with careful preparation, could be taken up by the young people, not only in youth masses or school masses. Specifically, once a young person is confirmed, one might be like right when resume that some ministry or parish school community would be a logical and expected outcome. So service within the liturgical assembly would be but one viable and admirable method of spreading the faith by deed as a true witness of Christ and appropriating young people in these roles. Um, cantor, altar server, musician, altar server, provide a strong and radical witness to the faith. We should not needlessly restrict the ministry of all people. St. John Paul II said here, the unity of the church is not uniformity, but an organic blending of legitimate diversities. Together with the ordained ministry, other ministries will be formally instituted to simply recognize and flourish for the good of the whole community. Small steps from liturgical assistance can result in a far more attentive discernment of the authentic vocations among the young people of faith. And the confirmation of says, Be active members of the church, alive in Jesus Christ, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Keep your lives completely in service of all, as did Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. Live in the liturgy, corporal works of mercy. When did you feed the hungry, go to naked, all that stuff? Simultaneously, these corporal works of mercy, this command to our people, is both a condemnation for the apathetic and a welcome for the charity. Condemnation for the apathetic, welcome for the charity. Liturgy's purposes, this is how we put it into life, put it into practice. Praise of God, taking the of people, and then again, commission to feed, give drink, clothe, welcome, visit, service hours. Did you have a question about that? Oh, um, the more recent generations, people have become quite charitable. Here's, here's a paradox of our time. Uh, in fact, many people give more than ever, service hours, confirmation, all this stuff. This um, might not, however, make the necessary connection of how this is a natural outgrowth of the liturgical immersion that we see. We might be living with it. But let's make sure we're drawing from the proper source that draws us and becomes us to Ite missa est. This is where the word mass comes from. How better fitting word for mass, our liturgy, than this last word spoken by the deacon. Go nor sent. That's the rough translation. There's the four options that the deacon or a priest can say at the end of mass. This perfectly encapsulates the point of celebration as it applies to our call as being living disciples, having been nourished and renewed by grace. As it puts an active command in the faith. Go forth to mass is in. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Go in peace, for the Lord of your life. That's our natural response of our hearts burning with the love of God. Authentic participation cannot merely be an external activity. In fact, this authentic participation is born out of a heart reconciling to God. It is a company of genuine participation to live the life of the church as a whole, including a missionary commitment to bring Christ's love into the whole of society. Day by day, we become and worship ourselves, pleasing to God by living our lives as a vocation. Beginning with the liturgical assembly, the sacrament of the Eucharist commits us in our daily lives to do everything for God's glory. This cyclical pattern, we desire to glorify God in the Eucharistic sacrifice, the Eucharist sacrifice then charges us to glorify God in our life and our vocation. See how that just keeps stirring us, stirring. The ritual and right conduct. The paradox of our time is that consequences seem somewhat more established than the normal sorts of their power. I just mentioned this. In this case, the widespread call to service and exemplary charity create, while at the same time facing the challenge of a perceived lack of liturgical participation. While charity and service are the lot, they should be recognized in the right order that this conduct from, comes from life-giving and sustaining grace of these sacraments. It's not just participation in the grace of the whole of life. Closing the circle, once again, there's a three little pattern. Word and sacrament brings us to God's love. God's love. 
calls us to our response. Our response is that of conversion. From that conversion, that beauty and the good is the true and ethical standards. And from that, our mission, right? Mr. Goji is a way of interpreting life in light of the mystery celebrated. By entering more deeply into the sacramental images and uh, scriptural stories, the newly baptized do appropriate uh, the significance and meaning of the initiation signs. Symbolic actions, actions make present God's covenant relationship of faithfulness and call the assembly to plumb the depth of God's love and respond with a resolute heart. The conversion that has taken place in and through the community manifests itself in its ethical standards. The purpose of the process is mission. That the newly baptized might hasten to do good works, to please God, and to live a good life. Let this be the scope and sequence of our liturgical life. It requires active participation, not only during the salvation, but in the preparation before, not to mention the resultant mission follows. Before, during, and after. Matthew 7, 9 to 10 says, Which one of you gives, uh, would hand his son a stone when he asked for a loaf of bread? The church's pastors should have family support, guide, and encourage the lay faithful to live their vocations to holiness within the world which God so loves that He gave His Son to become its salvation. So why this emphasis? The ch you are the church of today. Never say that you are the church of tomorrow. They are the church of right now. This document responds to the need of uh, renewed emphasis on you because promise, prophecy, and hope exude <coughs> from the young members of the body of Christ. The recent study shows that highly religious teenagers appears to be doing much better in life than less religious teenagers. At the same time, unfortunately, while most of us teenagers generally feel positive attitudes toward religion, religion is not a big deal to them. And spiritual and religious understanding are very weak among American teenagers. So how can the simple message of the Eucharist, being the font and summit of the church's activity, gradually be seen as no big deal? The church's the challenge of conveying solid theology to interested acts and adolescents is still drastically needed. They say nothing about the vast challenge of reaching uninterested discussion and challenge to deeper faith and strong beliefs. We might suggest that a comprehensive approach not only to the ministry but also to the faith formation is desperately needed. A consistent respect and hospitality for young people in the church is needed across the board. No one can afford to ignore young Catholics. Don't fear their bluntness, their outward disinterest, their probing questions. They all must be met with certainty of faith and hope and joy. An open invitation to the good work of liturgical catechesis must remain, not only for young Catholics, but for all, in a renewed spirit of evangelization and discipleship. Stepping out of the way of the confirmed young people taking the rightful roles seems necessary and just, letting them participate. Respecting the diversity of the church, not only in culture, but also in age. And in every other manner, this example that Jesus set for us is the call that he would doubtless offer us. Back to Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy, paragraph one. Our goal remains to impart an ever increasing vigor to the Christian life of the faithful, to adapt more suitably to the needs of our own times, those institutions which are subject to change, to foster whatever can promote union among all who believe in Christ, to strengthen whatever can help the call of mankind into the household of the church. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together and pray that you bless each of those here with us today with that renewed sense of vision and hope for their ministries, their respective uh, missions, and carrying out their good work, building the kingdom of heaven here on earth, reaching out, forming those relationships with our gen young generation, which are comprising our current church. <coughs> may us all, may we all, by the example of our authentic, our authentic Christian life, seeking to draw ever closer to, especially in the deep liturgical minis minis mysteries that we celebrate, draw others, especially those young among us, to that ever increasing excitement, awareness, and joy that awaits them at the Eucharistic table. Your will be done as we pray, our Father, who art in
holding your lunch from you. But if you guys would like to stick around, if you have any questions, I'm happy to chat with you guys. If you need to go.